Well, Democrats in disarray has been a favorite headline of the Washington-based news media for the last several decades. The alliteration is so tempting to headline writers that they have been known to use the Democrats in disarray headline at the slightest provocation, including in many instances when it wasn't even vaguely true. Most Democrats in disarray stories that I have read over the decades have been at best exaggerations and at worst, outright falsehoods. And so I've been trying to think all day, more than all day, <laughs> about the word to describe what is happening to Republicans right now. And I, I, I couldn't find it until a little after 7 p.m. this evening on Joy Reid's show when Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal delivered the phrase, Republicans in ruin. And there it is. That is where the Republicans are tonight. On the night when they won the majority in the House of Representatives. It should be a triumphant night for Republicans. But here's why it isn't. Let's begin with Rupert Murdoch, who has been running the media campaign for the Republican Party for decades now. Rupert Murdoch owns the Fox Propaganda Channel, the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, and right-wing publications around the world. Today, Rupert Murdoch's New York Post, Donald Trump's favorite newspaper, a newspaper whose founder was Alexander Hamilton, published a short article, a very short article, on page 26 that is the best piece of writing I have ever read in the New York Post. Now, I didn't read Alexander Hamilton's version of the New York Post, but this is the best piece of writing I've ever read in that newspaper. And it is a flawless description of one element of the Republicans in ruin story. The headline is, been there, done that. With just 720 days to go before the next election, a Florida retiree made the surprise announcement that he was running for president in a move no political pundit saw coming. Avid golfer Donald J. Trump kicked things off at Mar-a-Lago, his resort and classified documents library. Trump, famous for gold-plated lobby, ho ho lobbies and for firing people on reality television, will be 78 in 2024. If elected, Trump would tie Joe Biden as the oldest president to take office. His cholesterol levels are unknown, but his favorite food is a charred steak with ketchup. He has stated that his qualifications for office include being a stable genius. Trump also served as the 45th president. Who wrote it? Who delivered this masterpiece of prose? We don't know. It simply says post staff report. That just means it is the consensus now of the New York Post. This is Rupert Murdoch, who has injected the most poison to the body politic of America than any media mogul in history declaring war on Donald Trump's presidential candidacy. The New York Post and Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal editorial board have blamed the Republican failures in the elections entirely on Donald Trump. Donald Trump cannot win anything without the full support of Rupert Murdoch and the television players he pays at Fox to say what Rupert Murdoch wants them to say. Last night, Sean Hannity was not allowed to show the entirety of the Trump announcement speech. Everyone else at Fox is rapidly running away from open support of Donald Trump. Sean Hannity will probably tiptoe away more quietly and slowly than the others. But even if Rupert allows one hour on Fox to sort of support Donald Trump, that won't be enough for a candidate who has never been able to win the most votes for president. If you think Rupert Murdoch is the kind of tough, strong media mogul played so brilliantly by Brian Cox in HBO's succession, you would be wrong. Rupert Murdoch is weak. He is unguided by principle. He has taken a stand against Donald Trump before in 2015, one month after Donald Trump 
attacked John McCain at the beginning of the Trump presidential campaign. Rupert Murdoch tweeted then, when is Donald Trump going to stop embarrassing his friends, let alone the whole country? Rupert Murdoch wanted Donald Trump to drop out of the presidential campaign in 2015. But as Donald Trump increasingly captured the affections of Rupert Murdoch's audience, Rupert Murdoch took his money-making orders from his audience. So no one can count on Rupert Murdoch to remain so strongly in opposition to Donald Trump. But Rupert Murdoch is off to a good start in his attempt to kill the Trump presidential candidacy. Every professional Republican did not want Donald Trump to do what he did last night. Every professional Republican knows that Donald Trump hurt the Republican Party very badly in the last election. He lost governorships. He lost Senate seats. He lost House seats. And very importantly, Donald Trump lost campaigns for Secretary of State in key battleground states where he was hoping to completely corrupt the voting process in those states in future elections. We will be joined later in this hour by the Democratic winner of the election for Secretary of State in Nevada, where democracy was very much on the ballot in that election. After Donald Trump ruined this election for Republicans, no professional Republican wanted Donald Trump to ruin the upcoming runoff election for Senate in Georgia on December 6th. Professional Republicans are all worried that when Donald Trump becomes the issue in a campaign, the Republican loses. So Republicans now expect to lose on December 6th with Donald Trump's candidate, Herschel Walker, running against Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock. That would give Democrats the clear majority in the Senate of 51. They would not need Vice President Kamala Harris's vote in the Senate to win every vote. Having 51 votes in the Senate means that Democrats will have clear majorities on the Senate committees, which means their legislation will move through those committees faster. And much more importantly, President Biden's nominations of federal judges will move through the Senate Judiciary Committee and the confirmation process much faster. Very little will happen legislatively in Congress in the next two years because Democrats controlling the Senate will find very little to agree on with the House of Representatives controlled by Republicans. Democrats in the Senate might pass some bills to show America what they stand for, knowing that Republican control of the House means that they will never have those votes passed in the House. But what will Republicans do in the House of Representatives when they have control? What legislation will they pass that America will support? The repeal of Social Security that Republican Senator Rick Scott talked about. The repeal of Medicare that Senator Scott talked about. He said he would repeal and replace them, just like the Republican promise with Obamacare. Will the Republicans in the House be able to assemble a majority to pass anything? That is in doubt tonight, because the Republican majority is going to be so tiny it is going to, and it is going to include some of the very craziest people who have ever served in federal elective office in the history of this country. And those crazy people will have power in this Republican House of Representatives because in the tiny majority, as we have seen in the United States Senate, every member of the majority has power. Last year, if one Democratic senator was unwilling to vote for something, then it was stuck. That will now be Kevin McCarthy's problem in the House of Representatives if Kevin McCarthy is actually able to assemble enough votes to be elected Speaker of the House in January. That is in doubt tonight because of Republicans in ruin. Mitch McConnell survived a vote on his continuing as minority leader of the Senate, but he only got 37 Republican votes when he used to get all of the Republican Senate votes for his leadership. The only things Republicans will be able to do in the House of Representatives is use committees to conduct investigations. They have promised an investigation of Hunter Biden. That would be like having the Benghazi hearings with Chelsea Clinton as the witness instead of Hillary Clinton. The majority of Americans are not going to appreciate Republicans beating up on and humiliating someone who admits his addiction to drugs, someone who was very close to death because of that addiction and whose problems are in no way connected to Joe Biden's performance as vice president or president. Republicans have also promised to impeach Joe Biden. They are, of course, promising to impeach the president for nothing. If they do that, 
they are guaranteeing skyrocketing polls for Joe Biden and for Democrats and the easiest possible reelection for Joe Biden. Consider the example of the Republicans' last impeachment of a Democratic president. As the Republicans conducted their impeachment investigations of Bill Clinton, his popularity skyrocketed to 73 percent, the very highest of his presidency. And Bill Clinton wasn't legislating anything at the time. He was just getting investigated and attacked by Republicans. And in the 1998 midterm elections, the Democrats gained seats in the House of Representatives because of the Republican attack investigations of Bill Clinton. And so the House Republicans have a choice break their promise to impeach Joe Biden or impeach Joe Biden and watch the Democrats take over the House of Representatives again in the next election by a huge margin while Joe Biden wins re-election by a huge margin at the same time. That's the kind of choice Kevin McCarthy is facing tonight with Republicans in ruin. Chris Poulos, so you start off knocking on doors. What went through your head before that first walk up to a door to knock on that door? Well, you know, just to start, um, we knew this campaign was going to be an uphill climb. Um, Southington, where we live, is a, uh, a pretty Republican area. And our, our approach was to get out and get as much voter contact as possible. So I was excited. Um, I previously served on the town council and I, and I had some experience knocking doors and, you know, it's tough to motivate to get out of your house to get to that first door. But once you get out there and you start knocking, you get into a rhythm and it was uh, it's just inspiring to talk to people and to hear their stories, to hear what keeps them up at night and to talk to them about what their hopes are for the future. And so um, once started we just kept going. It was and, great. And as a high school teacher, you must have been knocking on a lot of doors where you knew the people who opened those doors. Yeah, I, I did know a lot of people uh, knocking the doors, and I actually teach in a different district than than where I uh, than where I where I ran for office. But having served previously uh, on the town council in town, um, a lot of people re remembered me from from past elections. And uh, we talked all about our town. I grew up here. We talked about uh, the way things used to be, the way things are, and, and the way things we, we hope be envisioned for, for the future. Senator Murphy, uh, so you, you knocked on those doors uh, some years ago. Uh, what was it like for you watching this campaign develop? And I'm sure you had an eye on it uh, when those returns were coming in and looking at, uh, you know, an, an area where you always had to win those votes, too. Uh, did, did it feel to you like this was going to be this close? Uh, well, I, I had hoped it would be this close. You know, there's two differences between the race that I ran you know, two decades ago and the race that Chris ran. One, um, when I ran, this town was a little bit more Democratic leaning. Um, uh, today, as he mentioned, it voted for Donald Trump in the last presidential election. Um, but second, I didn't know anybody in Southington because I had just moved there a couple of years previous. And so I was truly introducing myself to everybody uh, that I met. Um, but, um, you know, when I met Chris, um, you know, you know, I, I saw the fire in his eyes. This is not an easy thing for him to do. He's got two kids the same age as my kids. As he mentioned, he t teaches in a district the opposite direction from Hartford. And so this is a big sacrifice to decide to run for office. It's a part time job in Connecticut. You have to hold down another job. But he was so committed to the future of uh, Southington, the future of the state, that he made this enormous commitment to go out and knock on five thousand three hundred doors. And when you meet him, you know, you, you realize why um, he did so well, um, because he's willing to work with anybody. Uh, he just cares about people. And you saw he got a lot of crossover votes from Republicans. It shows how, you know, candidates hard work really still um, can't be beat. It's the it's the it's the irreplaceable factor in American politics. OK, Senator, uh, what advice do you have uh, for the man who will be taking this position that you used to hold? 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, I just uh, I hope he's going to keep knocking doors because, uh, you know, the, the one thing you need to do is stay totally connected to the people that you represent. And so, you know, I never stopped knocking doors, um, even when it was an election season. And I think he's going to show up at the state capitol with a better sense of what Southington cares about uh, because he talked to 5,300 people. And I think you just stay at it. That way you never get disconnected from what people care about. Uh, Chris Poulos, uh, the, I'm, I'm concerned about Connecticut losing a teacher of the year uh, to go into state government. What happens to your students? Well, you know, before I, uh, when I was encouraged to seek the nomination, before I did so, I sat down first with my family, but then with my principal and my superintendent. And we talked about the prospect of being elected. And they said, we're going to make it work. For me, it's important that in some capacity, I continue to teach. I think that gives me credibility. When I talk about children and families, I could speak firsthand from that position as a parent and also as a teacher. And so we're working on a plan that will allow me to stay in the classroom when the legislature is out of session and when the legislature is in session, um, how I can still have a presence at my school uh, on the days that I have a lighter load up there in Hartford. It was a nerve wracking election to watch, as President Biden put it, democracy on the ballot in Nevada, in your particular election and in the other secretary of state elections in swing states. Uh, what did you feel uh, going into this campaign, uh, knowing that you were running against someone who was, in effect, publicly suggesting that he would corrupt elections if necessary to make sure Donald Trump and others won. Thank you for having me on the show tonight. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about our win. After the primary election, I knew my opponent was going to be Jim Marchant. There was a huge burden put on my shoulders to understand that Nevada was going to have impact on the rest of the country. But an even bigger moment in the campaign is when Marchant stood on stage next to Donald Trump and declared that Donald Trump would be the president in 24. That is a scary statement. That is a scary thought because of the fact that Nevada has such an impact on our country. And to know that somebody was unequivocally going to determine who our future president was, is, without regard to the will of the Nevada voters. Yeah, I, I can imagine the, the weight of it. Um, we all felt the weight of these elections and the importance of them to the point where the president delivered a speech about them in particular, saying that democracy is on the ballot. Uh, we could feel the pressure from this distance. It, it's just unimaginable to me what that must have felt like as the candidate, knowing that you, you are the only person standing between that kind of potential election corruption uh, and democracy in Nevada. Again, you know, knowing what we had at stake in this election in 2022, but it was also what was at stake in 2024. We had a very close U.S. Senate race here with Catherine Cortez Nasto. She fought hard and won that battle. We have our other senator, Senator Jackie Rosen, that's going to be up in 24. We knew we needed to protect the elections, not just for Nevada, but for the rest of the country. Carrying that burden and carrying that weight every single day I woke up gave me the inspiration and the fortitude to get out there and fight every day and talk to voters and expose my opponent for who he is. The hard part, too, was that he never showed up for anything. He never addressed the voters in Nevada. He never justified his reasons for having the beliefs that he had or explaining why he made such extreme statements. He, was, he wasn't a serious candidate, but the thoughts and policies he represented were extremely dangerous. 